We have time for, uh, we have about 15 minutes for some, com <clears throat> sorry, for comments and questions. And because we're taping, we would appreciate it if you would please raise your hand if you have one, and Jacqueline Jones will bring you the microphone so you can speak your question into the microphone, and Jim will hear it and respond. great lecture tonight. I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts about the, uh, your perspective of the civil rights movement uh, over and against uh, the movement for civil rights for lesbian, gay, transgender, bisexual persons in America, and, and the, the lack of articulation of the needs for civil rights for this community from the African-American community, particularly the African-American church, with its, um, its very often being the homophobic rhetoric that's uttered from the black pulpits across our nation. Well, I've passed to two large congregations um, in the 60s, 70s, 80s. 90s, where we had openly, openly gay uh, lesbian people and we had openly gay couples. They, in Memphis, they did not, there was no such thing as their saying, I'm out of the closet, and I never heard them suggest that, but they were openly gay in their way in which they lived and walked, and this was very well known in the congregation. And um, if there were, as I'm sure there might have been, people who had various objections, they did not express those objections to those people, and they did not share those objections and criticism to other people in the congregation. Um, and that may be a peculiar thing of the, of the largely black congregation. I do not believe myself that this approach or homophobic uh, attitudes towards gay, uh, G, GLBT people is endemic to the black church. It is primarily orchestrated by the Jim Dobsons, the late James, um, oh, I've forgotten the name, Pat Robinsons, by the late Gerald, uh, Gerald Farwell, uh, the late James Kennedy. It's, it's, a, it's a sense that's being pushed around by a, a huge talk radio show and, and television shows that preach it. And they, are, they have discovered it for a very simple reason. Um, this kind of language was used against black people and some of those same people that I've named in the 50s and 60s, where they declared that the Bible requires racial segregation and Jim Crow law. And they used bad language and awful language about us, black folk. The movement across the 60s forced them to shut up. <laughs> and it was about that time, at the end of the 60s, then that Pat Robinson and the 700 Club discovered the sinfulness of GBL, GLBT people and used the same kind of culture, what Peter Gomes calls culturism to read into the Bible their particular fears and dreams, but worst of all, to read into the Bible their need to have a scapegoat in order to preach the gospel of Jesus because they haven't discovered the healing, redeeming core of the gospel of Jesus or of the Christ. So they, they have to have this other perspective and, and all. The, 
it should be said at the same time that uh, the unconditional grace of God, James Baldwin speaks of love as living in grace. And it is the it is the possibility and the necessity for every human being. There is no doubt that we in the struggle of the 50s, 60s did not get as far as we wanted to get at a demanding human rights, civil rights for all people. So I see the G G GLBT group as one of the groups that has to yet achieve the levels that they want for equality. The difficulty with that is not um, their struggle, but the difficulty with that is that that's one of the most powerful um, set of foundations in the United States, and very often they are managed by men, gay men, who still have their racism and elitism in their hearts. And so they, and I've worked with gay groups, you know, in, on some of these issues, they um, are still perpetrating the male domination uh, management control society, the repressive system of maybe the last 5,000 years. They have not yet joined Seriously, the human rights movement that must go towards nonviolence, must go to be inclusive of all humankind, and must break down the inequities that are available even in some of their activity. In Los Angeles, when Proposition 8 was on the board, uh, any number of my gay, uh, my gay uh, black gay men who are activists tried to get some of those foundations and the GLBT groups to pay attention to what kind of strategy would help them to galvanize and collect the support of the African American churches by and large in Los Angeles. And they were so racist that they could not accept that advice and counsel from activist people, including myself, including a number of other clergy. And so they did not do and were not supportive of the kind of effort that we knew would help save the day from the black community. So the so-called evangelicals are hammering away at the Hispanic community, the black community, to get those communities to adopt their ideological religion. Uh, and this is a place where we do need far more theological education, biblical education for all kinds of pastors across our country of all kinds of complexions. So I do not, I do not, uh, I do not subscribe to the notion that the congregation um, um, rejects civil rights and human rights issues. They're, it's it's the way that they are approached, and it's the way in which they teach, his, there's a historic sense in the church. At St. James A.M.E. Zion Church in Masson, Ohio, there was a hospitality, a genuine joy in one another in spite of issues and in spite of sins. That was wonderful to behold. And I mean, the congregations I've pastored have been congregations that wanted to stress graciousness and hospitality, hospitality for everyone. The same was true in the Holman Church. So... But the issue is people are being denied. And an injustice anywhere, as King said, is a threat to justice everywhere. Uh, moments of hatred and hostility for any people. Um, and I, I don't want to minimize this issue because the, uh, you know, the Pat Robinsons, the Donald Wildmans, family, uh, uh, family focus, They've made this issue a central issue, and they are discussing it instead of the neighbor uh, and, and what they need to be examining. If you want to see the Bible in supernatural terms as calling for the end of history and the end of the earth and the rapture and all that stuff, which, of course, is not in the Bible, you can easily do it. And 
Too many Christians in the United States are doing that. But if you're trying to pay attention to the, Jesus as the word of God, not the written script, if you're paying attention to how God has across the centuries, uh, millenniums, spoken to people in terms of their lives, in terms of history, uh, then there is no room in the Bible for the rejection or the demonization of any other human being. And it does not matter who they are. Uh, the, the, it, one of the most important things that I have gained from the Bible is that it does ask us to make choices as to whether or not we land on the side of ideology and idolatry or whether or not we land or see the necessity of following Jesus as a singular revelation of God's gracious care and purpose. And you have to make that choice. You can, take, you can, you can make a choice in the Bible for a war god, a tribal god, a money god. <laughs> all, all sorts of gods are there. All sorts of spirits are there. So you can make choices for that. And somehow we have to encourage our people to uh, listen to the, and hear the main choice that the word of God made flesh full of grace and truth is also available <laughs> as a choice to make. And that choice does not, that choice does not, does not give us any leeway for the <laughs> hostility towards any human being or any group of human beings. That, that choice um, does not give us um, the right or the right to make such a choices, such the choices we're making. But that's the bane of the church in these days. Uh, we, we love, we love fighting over um, GLBT business while we are able to therefore not get any conviction or compassion for the homeless and the hungry and for people, people who are bitterly hurting. Uh, I've discovered across the years that in some of these very churches that are preaching this stuff, they have people who are hurting and their own pastors do not have enough of Christ for them to pastor to that hurt that often is over the sexual issue, over gay, lesbian, and so forth, but also over a great, other, a great number of other forms of pain. Uh, I've, I've learned across the years that pastors in many congregations, rabbis in many congregations, are not aware of the fact that they have people in their pews who are wrestling uh, with the issue of whether or not they're going to have bread next week or a shelter over their heads next week. I think that's an atrocious thing. A school of theology needs to try to help the folk who come through here to have the lenses of the eternity so that they can see and feel and hear and observe and are ready to take action, willing to get out there and do something about it. That's one of the things I know about the movement in the 60s. I mean, I didn't know what I was doing. I had never tried to plan a massive campaign like this in nonviolence. That's why I'm thankful for Gandhi because he showed us the way very clearly, a methodology. But most of us did not know what we were doing. It was all brand new. But we had a sense that there's something wrong that needs to be corrected, and we had a passion that we were being called to get out there and try. Failure or not. That spirit, I think, is something the church needs today. <laughs>